joining with us and she will be you know going to deliver her lecture it would be of wonderful things at the outset you know i really thank uh, our management the principal for uh, having accepting all the uh, formalities now i would request uh, coordinator of uh, uh, our department zoology and wildlife biology mrs g sharmila uh, to formally welcome all the gathering thank you thank you jaykuma a very good evening to all of you i am mrs g sharmila assistant professor of zoology welcoming you all to this international webinar on strategic science communication organized by the pg and research department of zoology and wildlife biology avc college in association with iqac and the rnd cell of our college now before we start i just want to say few words on strategic science communication actually strategic science communication is creation of clearer and more effective ways to communicate scientific in matters to larger audiences it provides participants with a thorough and practical understanding of the process used in developing a communication plan including the development of a strategic framework and a accompanying action plan that allocates resources responsibilities and time frames it also has a strong emphasis on relating theory to current industry best practices it in implementing a strategic approach to planning communication activities the major pro project component is based around field we have to say as a learned resource person and i on behalf of the organizers extend a very very warm welcome to you next i also extend a hearty welcome to our honorable secretary beloved principal and head department of zoology and wildlife biology former professors faculty members from different institutions across different places researchers and student participants to this event and we are eagerly looking forward to have a highly interactive session thank you one and all and uh, now may i request our beloved principal and head department of zoology and wildlife biology to deliver the presidential address over to you sir thank you madam very good evening thank to you. every one of you indeed it is my great pleasure to see you all on this nice wonderful different kind of uh, webinar which is being organized by department of zoology on this nice occasion first let me take this opportunity to thank uh, chairman secretary and all the board of members for giving this wonderful opportunity to facilitate this kind of uh, timely and the essential and uh, important uh, webinar for different uh, stakeholders of uh, various uh, subjects and discipline indeed again i am very very happy because this is being organized by dr jay kumar let me take this uh, chance to thank jay kumar for providing this uh, wonderful opportunity and uh, all the above i also thank uh, nicole bennett for her uh, kind acceptance for delivering this wonderful science communi statistic uh, sci science communication lecture today madam introduced about strategic science communication in fact it is uh, very difficult we can write n number of papers by using our jargons for different subject experts but writing a common science to a common people is not that much easy although it looks extremely easy which is not that much easy if you try then you can realize how difficult it is so today madam will be delivering and showing lot of examples how to improve our strategic science communication it is very very essential although we write papers 
in a high impact factor journals and get a lot of citation on top of that uh, we are having a huge h index these are all very helpful for individually for our own career but at the end nowadays quite often people do ask out of this science out of this writing what society got from your science research that is what everybody asks but when it comes to the question of uh, asking this question everybody goes and blinks their eyes because we know very well that uh, sometime we have no other choice except uh, blinking our eyes particularly we most of the people doing research on pure science when you have this kind of uh, problem with the pure science you cannot say any applied value of your science but pure science badly needed to do any applied science therefore it is very very essential but uh, we have to do our pure science and publish papers and we have to try to take uh, maximum effort to reach uh, the society common public to understand the science of uh, everyday development uh, not only in our country all over the world it is our bounded responsibility because we are all doing lot of research and everything through the tax payers money who do not have any idea about uh, science and the development of science therefore it is our bounded duty to do this uh, strategic science communication as madam pointed out uh, she mentioned about uh, the strategic uh, uh, aspects but i really want to share one of my own experiences because i still do remember when i gave a talk in british ecological society conference during 28th december 1999 on the threshold level of oyster catcher most of uh, you may know what is oyster catcher it is a shore bird which mainly feed on uh, molluscan farm those birds are capable of identifying muscle shell thickness down to the level of by 0.036 mm which is much thinner than your hair even any of our equipment which we developed cannot measure that much precisely the thickness of the shell but they are detecting but lot of people when i gave the talk lot of people asked the question as well as the challenge is it possible does it happen the birds can differentiate only 20 percentage difference but this is a 3.6 percentage difference but subsequently i showed a lot of examples myself as well as my supervisor dr john gaskastad the professor stephen lee and the professor sutherland they are all worked together and they have shown a lot of mathematical modeling which clearly indicated that they are capable of uh, uh, differentiating any difference which is more than three percentage so which is a very minute difference which we cannot understand we cannot appreciate we cannot accept but really it is happening when i have given the talk immediately after the talk a person from london times came to me again that person's name is called nicolas he has come and he talked to me about that information i was explaining these things to him but uh, i did not uh, know what for he is asking about all this information just he asked everything to me and at the end he said sir i am from uh, times uh, magazine uh, times newspaper so i took interview with you most probably it will be published so i said okay that is fine and i am very happy for this one then i went home and i went to ha uh, hostel i studied in university of exeter for my phd uh, on uh, 31st i got flu so i was lying on the bed and i was waiting that time one of my colleagues you know, humphrey sitters called me and he said to me that congratulations i asked what do you mean by congratulation why you are congratulating me and he said that your interview has appeared in london times today which is a very nice interview which is describing about the capability and capacity and the amazing performance of oyster catches well done that is what he said then i took another two years to publish a wonderful paper in functional ecology which is a high impact factor journal almost five impact factor journal now that journal published a paper in 2002 about this concept but now we have citation which is reasonably good citation for the paper but uh, times uh, london times received citation for their interview 
which is several time higher than that what i published in that scientific journal therefore it is very very essential to understand that we have to publish all our information in the common uh, in the common forum which reaches to the uh, common public that is not that much easy again and again i say writing to the specialist because we are specialist therefore we can write easily to specialist but it is very difficult to write for uh, generalist but today nicole uh, uh, is going to talk about uh, strategic science communication for common public therefore i am sure that will give wonderful opportunity for you all to learn subsequently i worked with uh, dr professor rk sir uh, and he made us to write a paper uh, several paper in tamil in different type of tamil magazines and tamil newspaper ultimately that take uh, banaul as one of the components in the integrated pest management in government of india so ultimately by reaching this common newspaper common public that is being included in that one and i also remember i along with dr tyagi sensar we published a paper on the impact of developmental projects which is being published in another common publicly available newsletter which is being used in the court as a document for bringing the eia east coast road eia has been intensified because of that particular paper which we published in the newsletter therefore i am very sure i am always confident that how much you work hard and publish your information to high impact factor journals and all sorts of thing at the end now the society the community the scientific world as well as the government policy makers expect you to take your science to the common public in all the places all the funding agencies now they are asking how you are reaching this uh, information to the common public for that uh, today's uh, madams uh, talk will be very useful for all the scientists who can write their scientific information to the common public with these things once again i thank all the participants who are with us today for attending this seminar i also whole heartedly welcome our teachers dr g r sir dr m c s sir dr r k sir and the other faculty members from different institutions from different parts of the world also all my own colleagues who are in this meeting apart from that the students and friends and the people from different parts of the world i am very sure that this seminar is going to be a very good seminar for all the people who are really want to write something about their science to the common public i am sure the next few hours are going to be very entertaining hour for you as well as most productive hour for you with these things once again i thank madam for having given this wonderful opportunity for us to organize this web seminar and uh, i also thank all the participants for your valuable presence have a nice time enjoy the time uh, have a lovely seminar with these things once again i welcome you all thank you very much over to you madam thank you sir uh, thank you sir thank you once again sir for giving us a uh, wonderful uh, presidential address quoting your own personal experiences and hope uh, many of our participants would have experiences like this and today's lecture would definitely resolve such issues thank you once again sir now i request dr s j kumar who has created this beautiful opportunity for all of us to introduce our uh, renowned resource person to the participants over to you j kumar sir thank you madam this is a wonderful opportunity for me to introduce uh, nicole bennett i'm a bit nervous because now you know most of my senior pros uh, my teachers are there in the group so with that nervousness no i could start my uh, introductions yeah so nicole bennett what she is doing she is she researches science communication in the phd program at the stan richard school of advertising and the public uh, relation at the university of texas phd her work is at the interaction of science communication applied theater and the social justice before this she researched the biological impacts of climate change while earning her masters in ecology evolution and the behavior from the university of texas in fact earlier we had a chat of having a talk on climate change but now we find 
no, we, it, it is actually the most important one to communicate with others. She is a theater performer, instructor, director, and technical designer, and has won three B. Idenpain Award. What is that B. Idenpain Award? I just wanted to state some uh, you know, point about that. It is a council that recognizes the outstanding you know, theatrical performance, production, and design in Austin. It is so wonder that our resource person received three consecutive B. Idenpain Award from Austin. That is a great prestigious uh, one to say here. And she also won an Austin Chronicle uh, Critic Table Award in Texas. Nicole at present teaches improve to neurodivergent youth through the Building Connection program and uh, created STEM Pro, where she teaches scientists improve the boost their communication skill. What is STEM Pro? Here, now we need to know what is called the STEM. STEM, I would say, you know, the plant biologists would know, which is, which is the most important part of a plant. Here, again, STEM to a most important part of the communication. STEM means S for science, T for technology, E for engineering, and M for mathematics. Nicole, known for using her phrases very nicely, she termed it as like, no, yes, but versus yes, and. She often loved those two uh, phrases, actually. Yes, but, and yes, and. When you say yes, but, definitely, you know, you may have a number of reasons to do that. When you say yes and, definitely you may have a n number of will to do the same. So she is very nicely termed that we can do many things with a term called yes and rather than yes but. She visited India actually. That is the most interesting part I just I wanted to share with you all people. She visited India in the year 2008. Uh, I through SACON hosted her and then like, you know, uh, we have done a post-mortem of birds together. We learned the laboratory procedure together. And she's so flexible in the field. She never ever hesitates to go to any even remote conditions. She is so she is so flexible in the field. She manages even the leech bites in Silent Valley National Park at Kerala, so that she could remember, I believe. And then when she was in Thirunal Valley, she managed to interact with the local people freely. That shows she was so efficient in transforming her ideas to the local people, even in relation with the conservation of birds, despite her language barrier. She gained many achievements, but due to time constraints, I stop with this. I take this opportunity to thank our secretary, chairman, and the other eminent uh, members of our uh, board of uh, management board. I thank uh, my beloved teacher, like my principal. Whenever I discuss with him with a couple of activities, he say, no, yes, you go ahead. So we have such a person who motivates us to do many uh, activities like this. Thank you, sir, uh, for your permission. I uh, take opportunity to thank uh, IQAC uh, coordinator, R&D cell director, and department coordinator. I would like to thank all my senior professor who is there working with me in the department. I, I would like to thank all the teachers for you know, being here uh, to promote our, you know, uh, the uh, kind of activity what we have. And I know I thank all the you know, members or participants who is actually participating in this thing. So I, I once again, you know, welcome uh, Nicole Bennett. You know, though uh, India and uh, US is not uh, doing good against uh, COVID, with this situation we can able to have uh, such an international conference. So I really thank Nicole Bennett for you know accepting our uh, offer. When I you know interacted with her, like you know uh, immediately she accepted and said yes, I am ready, and I wanted to give a talk with the Indian scientist. She wanted to interact with the Indian scientist. After her talk, we will be having kind of more interaction wherein which I would invite all the participants to come forward and then share your views. How do we communicate the science into a non-science people? That is what the motto of this uh, webinar is. With this, I thank all the people and uh, the resource person. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. S.J. For your brief yet wholesome introduction about our renowned resource person. Thank you once again. And now, with uh, the introduction from Dr. Jay Kumar, sir, I invite our renowned resource person, Nicole Bennett, to deliver her lecture. Over to you, Nicole, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, I will share my screen. I'm so thankful for everyone who made it possible for me to be here. Um, this time, I am coming from Austin, Texas, which is also not doing great with COVID. 
Uh, so we feel for you, India, and everyone who is all around the world. Um, it is a nice uh, bright spot to be able to speak to you today a little bit about my research. And today we'll be talking, uh, you already had a wonderful introduction to what strategic communication is, uh, and I'll be speaking about why just giving science facts is often not enough to achieve the goals that we have. So my goal, I should start with my goal, because I'm going to start at strategic science starts with your goals. So my goal is to help you, a group of experts and scientific innovators, strengthen how you approach the issue of communicating your research. So an outline of my talk today is, uh, you're meeting me maybe for the first time, maybe for, uh, again, uh, some of you. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about my story. We'll talk a little bit about our goals that we have for science communication. I'll talk a little bit about the social science, why, why sharing knowledge is often not enough. And uh, we'll get strategic talk about some other strategies beyond just sharing knowledge. And then I'll talk a little bit about the research that I have going on. Um, and then we'll open it up to interaction because uh, I'm going to argue that uh, only talking at people isn't the only way I should ever communicate. I should talk with people. So Maya Angelou, uh, if you are not familiar, is an poet. And she says, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And this has been a core part of the research that I do. Uh, it's so tempting for science to get buried in the methods and the facts, but often what stays with people is how we make them feel. So, a little bit about my background and my story. So we, we can't really, uh, we have to start in India um, with uh, my travel to Tamil Nadu. Uh, Wanna come, everybody. <laughs> I worked with Sekon with Jay Kumar and did some work on painted storks. Here, his, his family has dressed me up uh, better than I have really ever looked. <laughs> so uh, they have tried to help me uh, become true Indian scientist. Uh, so this was part of start of my love for biology, uh, a lot of my love for field work, a lot of my love for nature. And then I went on to my here I am in the mountains of California with a big giant butterfly net. Uh, I worked on butterflies and was interested in conservation, uh, interested in questions of what is climate change going to do to species and their interactions. Um, I also have a fear of me doing a radio show because um, what I, Jay Kumar in my introduction introduced that I am very easily distracted by uh, the arts, which at the time my I did not like. I was doing a science radio show and really interested in science communication. Uh, I have gotten better at listening to that voice inside of me that says, this is what you're really interested in, this is what you value. Uh, my advisor at the time did not love that, um, but uh, the story ends up one. So I ended up leaving biology uh, because I started getting more interested in how we talk about climate change. Um, and I wasn't really sure what to do after leaving biology, so I taught children. I taught uh, about computer programs. Uh, so here I am, uh, lots of kids, and we're learning how to make websites with dogs and making complicated diagrams. Um, and here's where I learned that I really did like uh, teaching and I really liked uh, learning how, uh, teaching and talking with people. And I met my now advisor during this time. I was still very interested in science communication and I was thinking, oh, maybe I'll do a radio show or a podcast. And I, interv I was interviewing my now advisor. And by the end of our coffee together, he says, you should, you should come work with me. You should come back to academia and work with me. And I'd had such a bad time with um, my previous work that I said, no, never. <laughs> I will never do that. Um, but here I am in my third year of a PhD uh, working at the University of Texas. 
Um, so now I work on science communication. I'll talk a little bit about what the science of science communication means in just a bit. Um, here's a book I wrote the first chapter of about uh, science communication training. Uh, I also lead uh, theater courses for scientists to learn how to uh, communication skills and uh, kind of expand upon what's already good in their communication. So that's my brief story. Uh, the science of science communication is where I am now. And we think about kind of three different areas. We think about science, we think about the media, and we think about the public. And public, I guess, is anybody who's not a scientist. Uh, we also think about all of the interactions between these three groups. So we often think about how scientists talk with the media. How does the media talk about the, our work? Um, how does the public think about science? A lot of my work mostly focuses on scientists. Um, having been a biologist before, I'm very interested in how we, we train scientists and, and which scientists are communicating, as well as um, what kinds of spaces we're creating. Are we creating spaces where people feel like they belong or are we creating spaces where people feel like they don't belong? So my Venn diagram looks more like this. So my research and a lot of my practice and teaching lies of the intersection of science communication, applied drama and theater, as well as some social justice work on inclusion and belonging. So the questions I ask are, um, how can we create spaces where people feel like they have a voice, or they feel like they belong? Um, these sorts of issues are becoming, uh, I mean, climate change really brought me into this world, um, but COVID-19 is really highlighting the need for this type of work. So I talked about my goal for this talk, but something to think about as we're going through here are, what are your goals? What do you hope will happen from the time, money, and energy you put into communicating? Feel free to put these in the chat. I won't be able to see them yet, but I'll be able to return to them later. But what are your science communication goals? It's okay if you don't know these, but it's something that I want you to start with. So often we see articles that say, scientists, you need to be on Twitter. Scientists, you need to have a blog. And I'm gonna argue that that is a tactic. That is an activity. And what you should start with is what is your why? What is your goal? So maybe Twitter fits your goal, maybe it doesn't. So start with your goal and we'll work from there. So often, when I, we have done lots of research on scientists, given them lots and lots of surveys, lots and lots of interviews. Um, they'll often name sharing knowledge or perhaps now in COVID-19 fighting misinformation. Um, I would challenge you if those, for each goal that you have put, maybe you put it in the chat already, or maybe you're just writing it down and journaling, maybe it's inside your head. Um, I'm going to challenge you to ask yourself why. I want you to ask yourself why at least maybe three times. So, is sharing knowledge your goal? Would you be happy if that was the end? If you just knew more about your study species, would that be enough? And often that's not quite what is going to make you happy. So you ask yourself why again. Okay, if if that's if I want to share knowledge, is is that enough? It, would I just be happy if everyone knew more about science? And often, what we want to do is change people's minds or change people's hearts or change people's behaviors because we're really interested in protecting con and conserving natural diversity, or maybe we want to enact some policy. So often, when um, often in interviews, scientists will answer, "I want to just share knowledge," and and we'll kind of challenge them a little bit, and often we see that people want to have policymakers think about science, or they want a culture that values science more, or they're very interested in having young people choose science careers, or maybe something else. Your goal uh, might be different than this. So I've been talking a lot about goals because that is the most important thing. So we want to start with our goals. This is the, uh, the golden circle. Um, you want to start with your why and work your way outward. 
You start with your why, your goal, what's your long-term outcome? What would you be so happy if that happened? Is it uh, getting policy to protect the species that you care most about? Is it uh, having local people really truly collaborate with you on protecting the species? Um, thinking very deeply about that why is where you want to start. From that why, then we can think about short-term goals. This is a lot of, this is pretty much the same thing you probably do in your own research plan of like planning out how you're going to do your next research project. That's why it's called strategic science communication. It's a strategy. Um, so then you would think about short-term and we call those objectives. And then you would think about the what, what you want to do. What are the actual activities you want to do? Is it blogging online? Is it talking face to face with people? Is it holding uh, meetings where people get to ask you questions? Um, those sorts of activities are going to depend on your goal. Often people do this backwards and they start with the what um, and then a why maybe comes up later. Maybe we don't think that deeply about it, but I want to challenge you to think deeply about what your goals are and from there we can work to figure out what you should be doing. So here's some more research that we're gonna do. Um, we have also done surveys with scientists and asked them which objectives they prioritize. This is that how. We asked them if they want to increase scientific knowledge, if they want to create feelings like excitement or curiosity, uh, or if they want to build trust, or if they want to frame a message to resonate with their audience, or something else. And overwhelmingly, like I said earlier, number one is the one that people, scientists tend to do. This is um, from uh, my advisor and one of my close collaborators' work, um, Anthony Dudo and John Besley in the US. So overwhelmingly, scientists say they want to increase scientific knowledge. Um, I'm going to argue that that's not, a, that's not always the best. You probably know from the title of my talk that I'm going to argue against that. So the reason I'm arguing against that is we have something in science communication called the deficit model. And we want to, and I want to argue against the deficit model. The deficit model says everyone is just this empty vessel and I am going to give them my science and fill them up. And the problems are problems of scientific literacy. If people just knew more about climate change, if I just told them more about the species that I care about, then they would change. And we know from our own experiences that just throwing information at people doesn't work. The deficit model, where I am this expert on the stage and throwing information at you, doesn't work. That's why we have an interactive portion today. Um, and also, the, I'm going to talk, you're also very motivated to listen to me, so it's okay for me to be sharing information in this way. We have lots and lots of research that says if your goal, if your why is to change people's minds or change people's hearts or change people's behaviors, Knowledge doesn't really work on changing attitudes or changing behaviors. Here's an example of a study um, my collaborator John did uh, with uh, genetic modifications for crops. And knowledge really did not affect how people change their mind on something. So knowledge is very, very useful, and there is definitely a place for sharing knowledge. I'm not saying don't share knowledge. I'm just saying if you want to change people's minds, knowledge might not be the best way. So there's a book called Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. He won a Nobel Prize for economics, and he talks about these two systems of thinking. Right now, I'm hoping you're processing in system two thinking, the slower cognitive. It's okay for me to be talking at you because you're interested. When we're very motivated, we're in system two thinking. When we're not motivated, like if I'm at the um, store and I'm picking up uh, uh, some, some flour or something, I'm not really thinking deeply about it. I'm just getting whatever I used to get. I have quick and automatic thinking. So we have system one thinking that's very quick and automatic. We have system two thinking when we slow our thinking down 
and we think more deeply about something. Like if I'm going to buy a computer, I'm probably thinking more deeply about it than if I buy something that maybe I don't think as much about. At the same time, humans are what we call cognitive misers. We like to preserve our energy. So we're really not doing this slower thinking unless we really think we need to. So and we're really not likely to change our minds and form new beliefs unless we slow down our thinking. So it's okay for me to be talking at you for a little bit because you are invested, you're motivated, you're interested. But if I were to go give this talk to someone who didn't care about it, this wouldn't be a good way to do it. Um, they're probably more inclined to listen to like a flashy commercial. That's why commercials look like they do. And that's actually why I'm in an advertising department, which is, was a surprise to me. So if we want to think about strategy, these are the steps that I've already kind of talked about. You want to first start with your goal. You want to think about what behavior might I want to change. Then from your long-term goal, you want to think about your how. What beliefs, what feelings, what, um, what ways of reaching my audience. We call those frames could help me achieve that goal. Then we want to think about tactics or activities. What messages, what um, styles of delivery? Should I be online? Should I be face to face? Then we can think about number three, tactics. Uh, then once you have done your communication, it's not over. You need to think about whether it worked or not. So how can you tell whether it worked or not? We want to do some kind of checking in about our impacts. And um, the, the president's address earlier, uh, so I was talking about impacts, and that's really what we care about. What kind of impact do you want? And then these arrows go back and back and back because this is an iterative process. We want to start with our goals, and then from there, eventually get to our impacts. So. I talked about knowledge not being the best way, um, and knowledge is super valuable. When someone is already interested and motivated and they're coming to you with questions and curiosity, that is a great time for knowledge. in your work. But what happens before someone's interested? So, so if someone's motivated, if someone's interested, you can probably share tons and tons of knowledge. You probably experience this with young children when they're already interested in the animal you study or the plant you work on or the ecosystem you work on and they're asking you lots of questions. Then knowledge sharing is a great idea. But before then, we need to find ways to slow down people's thinking. Here are some ways to slow down people's thinking depending on your goals. One is creates excitement or interest. Uh, this is a museum, a science center in uh, Tamil Nadu um, that has some wonderful ways of creating excitement and interest. Um, they're not just throwing knowledge at people, they have this giant pendulum that gets people asking questions about physics. Excitement and interest plays a large role in motivating people to learn more. So if you can get someone excited or interested about your work, that can be a hook and can hook them in. There are lots of ways to do this. Storytelling is a really big one. Um, identifying with your audience, finding out what they like. Surprise is a great element. Um, my, my talk here has a little bit of surprise in it because you would expect a talk about science communication to be about sharing knowledge. And immediately I was like, that's not what this is about. Referring to the context is also important, especially now when we're all in a very strange context. That can be a really great way to get someone interested. Another way beyond just sharing knowledge is building trust. So all of the research we have on trust shows that trust has kind of two different dimensions. One is competence, which is how good you are at what you do. And the other is warmth. How caring do you seem to the other person? Scientists are seen as very, very competent. You do not have to worry about that dimension of trust. People trust scientists to be competent, but scientists are not always seen as very warm. And we can change that by showing that we care. Ways to build trust are kind of nonverbal behaviors that show that you care, 
also giving your listener a voice. So giving the person you're talking to a, a, a feeling that they're being heard by you is a great way to build trust. There's a lot of research on that that shows even when someone, even when you don't go along with their opinion, just being heard is enough to help someone feel like something is more fair and they'll trust you more. A last way to think about ways to reach your audience beyond just sharing facts is what we call framing your message. An organization called Frameworks has a really great podcast about this. This is making sure your message resonates with your audience. Climate change is a really interesting example of this because climate change interacts with people in many different ways, but your audience might care about one aspect of it. Maybe your audience really cares about health. Talking to them about the health impacts of climate change is going to be a better way to reach them than talking about the economic impacts. Maybe someone really cares about a certain species. Talking to them about that species is going to be a way to reach them. This is not about spinning it at all. We don't need to change any of the science. You're just highlighting the part of the science that matters most to that person. This requires knowing your audience though, which can be sometimes difficult when you have a really, really big crowd. So sometimes it takes a bit of feedback, sometimes it takes a little bit of research on your part. You can see the um, people that introduced me did a lot of research on uh, even looking up what the behind and pain was. So sometimes it takes researching your audience a little bit before. Um, this is really important for you to answer the so what question. So pretend like someone is asking, you're talking about your research and someone just says, so what? Why should I care? They're going to want to know that. How does it connect to them? Once you get it connected to them, they'll probably be willing to listen to more of those facts and knowledge. So framing your message is a third way. So we talked about creating excitement uh, and curiosity. We talked about building trust. And we talked about framing your message as three different ways that you can go beyond just sharing knowledge. Once you've got someone hooked and interested and curious, sharing knowledge is absolutely fine then. So on to uh, some of the work that I do. Some of the next research that I'll be involved with is I'm interested in science, technology, engineering, and mathematic graduate student involvement in outreach. There's a lot of work, all the research I showed you has been done on uh, scientists that have PhDs already. And we don't know as much about scientists who are being trained and why they might participate in outreach or not. Often it's uh, not rewarded in the same ways that uh, high impact journal articles are rewarded. So why do people participate in a behavior that's not rewarded? Often, like me, they, re they probably really care about it. So this fall, I'll be doing interviews with graduate students to figure out why they get involved in, re in outreach and also whether they feel like they belong in science or not. Science is uh, traditionally an unfriendly space for some people, and I would really love to be a part of seeing that change. So I'm interested in people who feel like they don't belong or feel like they do belong and how can we create that, you know, how can we widen that circle? How can we have more people feel like they belong in science? Another study that I'm working on this summer is a survey of scientists about the empathy they feel uh, during times of COVID. So we have this pandemic uh, and we have um, scientists, we're told that empathy is really important, but I'm interested in whether empathy changes in different contexts. Another study that we're doing right now, I've uh, been talking with people at Twitter, and we are gathering information about how scientists talk about COVID on Twitter. So there's a lot of misinformation out there. I know India has been uh, suffering much like the U.S. has on lots of pseudoscience and lots of, and, and some of it is malicious, but some of it is just uncertainty. I'm interested in how scientists uh, correct misinformation or how they interact with misinformation information on Twitter. So that's a current study that I'm doing. Another study that's happening in the fall is with young people. 
we are coming together. I'm bringing scientists to meet with young people virtually, of course, um, and we're going to be creating plays about our futures under climate change. And I'm curious about how young people think about their futures, how they think about their own activism around climate change. And I'm interested to see how scientists are transformed by working with young people. Does this help them move beyond just sharing knowledge? Do they then start thinking about those other objectives I was talking about? Do they start thinking about building trust or uh, building excitement and interest or maybe framing? I'm interested in, to see if there are changes in the scientists themselves as they go through this process of making art about climate change. And I am continuing to do uh, improv, which is uh, unscripted theater for scientists. Uh, this helps scientists do a better job of thinking on their feet and gives them some training that they don't get in other ways. Um, I, I currently work with the Austin Center for Media Engagement at the Moody College of Communication, and I also receive some of my funding from Planet Texas 2050, which is one of the grand challenges of UT that is interested in resilience. So those are some of the future directions. So some of the, if you're interested in what uh, type of research I do as someone who came all the way from biology and is now a social scientist. And with that, uh, that is the end of my talk for today, or the part of talking at you. I would love to switch it back over to our host, um, and perhaps we can do some interaction. Thank you very yep. much. Thank you, madam, for your uh, wonderful talk. Yes, as you wish, no, we could have a more interaction. Uh, yeah, so now uh, the session is now open for interaction. Like, no, she shared her view, like how the science people can transform their information into a non-science people. So now I would uh, open up uh, the interaction. So participant, please unmute your mic and then, you know, just post your queries or your suggestions. And I just wanted to highlight one more thing here. So in India, most of the scientists do believe on conspiracy theory. Uh, how do we go about that, actually? How do we try to stop that in, in the case of COVID-19 and some other incidences? So such a kind of you know, uh, thinking and interaction could be improved. So now I would request uh, uh, my principal, uh, Dr. Uh, Aran sir, to lead the discussion so that everybody can join the interaction. You feel free to interact about the concept, about the science, about the technology, about the engineering aspect, about the mathematical aspect. Yes, STEM pro, uh, the person mm -hmm working on that is waiting for uh, your uh, questions and queries to clarify. Thank you. Jay Kumar, thank you very much for your question. Uh, just I will wait for Madam's response. From there, we can take further. Yes, thank you. I really like this question of how do we and make sure I understand it too. How do we deal with conspiracy theory? And this is an open question we are still struggling with. Otherwise, I think the world would look different. Uh, but one technique that seems to work is uh, almost empathizing. Like, on trying to understand, it can be very easy to just like argue with someone and be very angry with them. But often conspiracy theories come from uncertainty. It comes from wanting to control. And if I can make up this lie, and I feel like I control the world. So often someone who has a conspiracy theory is because they are feeling very uncertain. So often empathy and care are the first step, at least. We don't have a full solution. Um, and I think it's like many things, like trust, it takes so much time. It's not, there's no simple fix. Thank you, madam. Over to you, sir. 
thank you very much madam okay and uh, invariably that is uh, in my feeling although you said uh, in uh, if you look at uh, this conspiracy it is mostly with a small bunch of people rather than a wider spectrum it may be getting higher and higher now because of the popularity as well as the importance which is being given for the science in the name of uh, going for uh, high impact factor journal and uh, publishing big things and uh, invariably in western countries in my personal experience as madam said if you are giving a talk in the radio they give uh, a huge uh, weightage for that kind of contribution or a interview in a television that is being given a huge weightage rather than publishing a paper in a high impact factor journal don't mistake me i am not saying that you are you need not uh, submit or publish papers in high impact factor journal it is essential but at the end that reaches only the specialist which they are working along with you in your field but if it needs to reach your home you have to go for common science or public uh, mass media that is important but here as far as i know that much of importance is not being given so far in uh, the recent changes particularly after having had the uh, impact factor and the um, uh, the score based system for promotion and other things which mostly made the people to think about competitive way rather than taking science to the common public but as uh, you pointed out jack ma it may be true with a smaller proportion of uh, population that is what my feeling but i did not read any specific paper or uh, commentary or uh, any article pertaining to this kind of information therefore i don't have much information to talk on this aspect thank you very much jack ma thank you sir vidudale is there uh, from singapore uh, Yeah, yes, he has posted a question in the chat yeah. box. You can read to madam. Therefore, oh. she can answer for that question. Yeah, but that is there. And in case if you are there, you could you know discuss right now. Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, this is very really, really, hi. Nicole. It was a great talk. Uh, thank you. It was very, uh, you know, as you said, it was the uh, it, it did had the surprise uh, element that you said that knowledge is not important. because i had the other way around i was thinking like knowledge is the one that's most important but i and also you know as you said like in most um, cases when we try to say facts it bounces back and uh, you don't really persuade people and so on that's true um but it's kind of you know uh, for me uh, you said that you know it's uh, it's important how you make the person feel that's what is going to uh, you know um uh, let them think about what you want them to think about um i'm not sure if uh, if i get it wrong or something but i i think you know people who are coming with solar signs or all these conspiracy theories they are more appealing actually right so mm. it's it's kind of the same element they are bringing in to the people's plate right so so i don't know how to differentiate that from uh, you know non science and and science Yes, thank you for this. Uh, I was just thinking about the same issue as we were discussing conspiracy theories and you're you're exactly right. The reason that pseudoscience can be so appealing is it often does these things better these kinds of advertising flashiness better than scientists do. Um but my hope is scientists have a lot of credibility. and a lot of um expertise and trust my hope is that they'll be more often and there's a lot of research on authenticity so i think that there is also power in uh coming with knowledge and credibility and expertise and also maybe knowing a little bit about how the human mind works um using these advertising things with an authentic way 
I believe there is power there, but you're absolutely right that that is why these things are so appealing is that they're flashy and um, engaging and, and they make us mad or make us sad. They inspire our emotions in ways. Um, my hope is that scientists could do this with authenticity. And there is a lot of research showing that um, there's, a, there's still quite a bit of trust in scientists. So I think that our trust plus showing our human side might be able to help combat some of that. But you're, you're absolutely right that that is why it's so appealing is it's a lot like advertising. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Thank you. Thank, thanks for that. Uh, good evening. Hello. I am R. Karthik again from the host college. On behalf of our college, first and the participants, I appreciate you. Then we all know that the knowledge information is, of course, the sixth factor of production in addition with the land, labor, capital, entrepreneur, and technology. But the universal threat all over the world nowadays is the information asymmetry. From your experience, uh, can you give possible strategies for bringing the or converting the asymmetric information into symmetric one? Thank you for your question. Could you repeat the last part? You want? Um, I'm hearing that you would like some strategies for bringing some information. Could I? Could I hear you one more time? Sorry, my internet is messing up sir could you explain your question again sir yeah yeah thank you the common threats all over the, yeah yeah the common threats all over in all the fields is nowadays asymmetric information asymmetric knowledge so from your vast experience in this field can you suggest some of uh, some possible strategies for converting the asymmetric information to symmetric one I'm hearing you say asymmetric information and symmetric. Could you um, maybe offer me an explanation? Yeah, 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 Thank yeah, you. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think I'm not understanding what asymmetric information is. Yeah, asymmetric information is a common uh, problem nowadays uh, all over the world it is facing now. It is uh, one of the constraints for reaching our sustainable development. That is a lack of knowledge in all fields, lack of information, wrong information. Mm. It is, of course, asymmetry. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah. yeah. Um, How this asymmetry can be brought into symmetry? Is there any scientific uh, strategies available for that? I wish I had an easy answer for you. Thank you for this really important question. I think it's an important question that many people are working on. Um, sounds like you are a part of it. I think that uh, there's no easy answer here. Time and trust. Uh, unfortunately, with many of these things, we have to take the long way of time and trust and disseminating information. Um, I wish there was an easier way. We we hoped with like the internet that it would be easy to just give information to everyone at once. But I think that a lot of this has to do with uh, trust and time. Hopefully that is a uh, not too unsatisfactory answer. Oh, well, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Nicole, just I would like to ask uh, one more. Uh, question or clarification just yeah. now jack mar mentioned about conspiracy in uh, science but it is true with the political agenda in a lot of places that is what the main uh, thing they are following although science is strong still they have their own uh, uh, survey or something and at the end they come with some statistics and they convince the people and they make the policy that every country does mm -hmm. invariably whether it is the uh, country which is having a lot of sufferings and even with the covid you can see every country is uh, dynamically changing their uh, uh, that uh, we cannot blame because nobody knows we have to come to the reality 
a government cannot they are not coming from heaven they are normal human being raised to that level so they can think they can react the way they can do that is different but uh, when he was talking about this thing the another thing suddenly hit me in my mind lot of journals for making or increasing the impact factor they invite a popular person and write something wrongly therefore it can be cited very rapidly therefore they can rise their impact mm -hmm. factor that is being written as a article in couple of journals mm -hmm. most probably that may be the one of the reason the royal society completely came out of the uh, impact factor business so it is uh, this conspiracy not only with the political even it is strongly exist with our academic or research world so when we are having this kind of problem jai kumar how we can uh, go and uh, uh, complain the political people one issue but at the end when you are taking this science to uh, the common public as uh, just now she said in different kind of uh, mass media tools either it could be a daily newspaper or weekly magazine or uh, tv or radio or uh, public uh, uh, talk then ultimately you can reach as i pointed out from my own experience still i do remember that uh, incident uh, london times which was published which had a huge influence among the common public and in fact i was so happy that uh, that is a lovely way to say goodbye to the last century for me so if you are consistently trying to bring your uh, science to this kind of uh, uh, non science people by using this mass media i think uh, we can definitely achieve and we can slowly eradicate this conspiracy business but we have to eradicate this one in our scientific world then only we can go to the politicians we know that they are doing their job is to do that one we have no other excuse <laughs> thank you yes okay. most probably you can respond for this madam because this is what my uh, feeling experience and knowledge and uh, what i learned from the papers which i am talking to you my response is that i definitely agree scientists are human and we are very susceptible to the same things that catch us up in the media i think you were bringing up covid-19 is is almost a pseudo experiment for science communication what happens when we speed up science when we are so uncertain we follow the wrong trail we don't have the same reproducibility um we have a a lot of fear and uncertainty and the the things the cracks in science become much more visible in that uh like you said we need to be very um very close to what science means we need to think about reproducibility we need to think about what is evidence what, why do i believe a claim it's not just a not just a commentary written by someone who's famous and a human it is something that is backed up by evidence. So I think you you put all of the uh, details in there that I would have I'm just going to agree. Thank, Thank you very much. Hello. Hello. Uh, I am retired from Satya Narayana from the Department of Wildlife Biology AVC College. My lord do right. Uh, good evening. Now good actually evening. Uh, my experience is that see we, we here we are we are confused see the science the scientists but publication is a different way of doing things and when you want to go to the common man you don't relate with your scientific public scientific publication for academic achievement it is not achievement for the common man okay mm. for your academic career now after doing the research or scientific way you can think about the way in which you convert you transform for the purpose of the common people that is called the popular science for example i was doing for the research on the indian blue pea fall pavok status on the peacocks in tamil nadu in the different villages okay i was just doing on the breeding biology of these pea falls to the villages i will be meeting daily the villages they are not even the educated then they will go on tell stories about the peacock they say the peacock never mates when they say they will lick and they can see then i will listen said i don't argue with them first thing is because i know what i studied in the field for one year two years three years then i developed a knowledge 
then i go to the common for popular science i know that it is the the, the what are the droppings there there is a white structure that is called the uric acid they thought they are the sperms when the peacock dance the male dancer it will just bend and when the bend they thought say the casual observation they never observe like us science so what they will do is oh it is licking that sperm and then they can't see then i slowly tell them sensitize them no this is not the way this is the what we have that i just take the dropping to the lame in tamil i say that lapa idala illa lapa this is the way so i have to what i i i should not feel as a scientist i should not feel as a professor there i become a, a common man there and then mm. i sense that i explain them in the, in their terms like that they are very happy to know that oh this is the first time we learned that like that we have to go to their level and then communicate with them that time i should not that if if i talk to them like this communication whether i get the impact factor of that no you should not so don't ask all the scientists don't relate for impact. academic career is different out of this you should not go relate with that if i go work for one year or six months for this popular science then whether you give a credit no that you should not combine with the impact factor of academic career otherwise if you think like that you never go for the popular science so i all because all the teachers as well as scientists you think about go to their level also, like wetlands also i go for the common man they will tell them in their way in their like a story tell the story tell them sensitize them and one more thing i want what is our feeling about the target group in order to have the popular side whether the school children is the best for the as you think the target group so i had a nature club where i found that the target group is from maybe from the uh, we, we have the 6th 5th standard to 10th standard that that is from the age group of 10 to 14 years that is the best target group for, to sensitize the populace what is your opinion on that thank you thank you for your excellent uh, story that was a great illustration of uh, you could have given my talk in your story <laughs> um i i really enjoyed uh, hearing about how you talked with people about the peacocks and if you had talked to them in in the same way you would have a journal they might have felt talked down to or i'm i'm so happy to hear that story as far as your question about target group um i might back the question up to uh it depends on your goal so if your goal is um to change policy maybe the children are not in the government yet um but if your goal is to excite new generations about science that would be a great target group so i think your target group is chosen after you choose your goal um although those are very fun target groups they sound like a great it, also your uh opportunities matter like you may only have availability of school children nearby and take advantage of it it sounds like a fun a fun opportunity to talk with people <laughs> thank you very much thank you yeah now over to abid hussain please you know you can ask now thank you hi nikol uh, this hi. is uh, abid and i am probably the only non science person in the in this conversation okay so i am a <laughs> reporter with uh, with a renowned publication and i specifically cover advertising and marketing in india okay so more ex me then <laughs> pardon oh uh, yeah no I mean, more much some... so before before the science people take take over the conversation let me just tell you i absolutely love your hair it's brilliant <laughs> okay so as a non science person i feel that there is very little science that comes out of the science domain uh, or the stakeholders mm -hmm. of science in india okay so there is very little conversation that happens around the developments in 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 the in, in the non, in the public domain like whatever whatever developments that are happening inside the labs inside the universities they don't they don't come out whatever that comes out comes out in the form of journals and, uh, as as the folks here mentioned so journals are not meant for people like i i'm not going to go go and read a journal i'll probably watch a video on youtube or maybe on twitter or maybe on on some blog or maybe something some a uh, friend shared with me Mm -hmm. and i also noticed this uh, uh, despite being a nonsense person i i am extremely in love with insects so i am a part of a huge group on facebook okay so i see very few people despite being a part of the group very few people from india posting stuff on on mm -hmm. the group they, they don't they don't participate at all so i'd like you to touch upon a point saying that what should scientists do 
to put more science in the public domain to generate more conversation among the people like that's where that's how you kill that's how you uh, kill those uh, misbeliefs disbeliefs you if i if i may say so mm -hmm. thank you for this question i think it is one of the um questions at the heart of a lot of my research that i struggle with um and i think it is important to think not only of individuals but also of systems here because an individual scientist is within these systems uh yeah. that are often not rewarding that often and and i i come from experience of that of being as a biologist told only to publish papers only to ask one question to stop yeah. doing so many radio shows <laughs> well, luckily i'm very stubborn um but uh i think that there are and, and there are scientists that are reaching out i think we have a similar issue in the u.s of um needing to take so, a look at our sorry to interrupt. Sorry to interrupt. if i may if i may put it simple and straight in india i have to go look for the science the science doesn't come to me yeah i want i wonder uh, some of the research that we do is interested in uh, what happens when we reward scientists for reaching out to the public like we do for hmm. publishing in journals? I think that would be an interesting world. <laughs> I think you would have more scientists posting in your insect group and uh, more sharing yeah. of that. So I think it's part, partly individual and partly uh, that we are in systems that uh, only reward yes. us for certain behaviors. Yes. But how do you how do we get out of that? There has to be a solution, isn't it? Yes, <laughs> that is the um, the big question. Yeah. And I think part of it is that reward structure. I think part of it is um, rethinking how we so, actually. Uh, if I may, if I may say so, you'll find people talking about technology. You'll find people talking about AI. You'll also probably find uh, people talking about business about politics you'll find people talking about a lot of stuff but when you when you look at those uh, uh, bits and pieces of science that are coming out every day you hardly find anyone talking about it i, I don't think there are no takers for these conversations or uh, these new bits of information but i only feel that there are no communicators in that space like it's my personal belief or my understanding from whatever i have seen so far yeah i think i think it's partly what i said earlier but also i think i think things are changing and I hope things are changing. So in the U.S., things are starting to change. We see in uh, in Europe, things are uh, have changed a lot more. Like more scientists are reaching out. It's being more rewarded. In the U.S., we are starting to realize, oh, things like COVID make and climate change make make sense for. We need scientists to talk to people. So I imagine. I Instead of going into the extremely complicated topic, just look at this thing. Like when the moment Trump comes out and says that we can inject ourselves with sanitizer, the, the yeah. very next second there is some scientist like blowing it up, saying that no, it doesn't work like that. You have to, you don't you don't go to go and do that. It's going to kill you. But I don't mm -hmm. think that it's going to happen in India. So if if the PM comes out uh, comes out and says that you're going to go and inject yourself with sanitizer, I'll probably see some deaths. Like. That's when people will understand you. Okay, let's so let them let them do it. It actually kills people. Yes, I wonder in time if it will change. I think people are starting to uh, wake up a little bit. Um, also, your PM is doing a better job of saying things than me. Yeah, let's decide. A, let's let's analyze our own PM. Like we, we, <laughs> might, have, we might have different opinions. <laughs> Which is very true. Thank you so, so much. Um, Hello. Yeah. Yes, we did like. So just just a follow up on that discussion, right? Um, so um, I, I, when I was hearing Abid's uh, you know discussion on comparing uh, Indian scenario to anywhere in the West or in the US specifically, one thing I see uh, is that most people in India uh, who gets science, uh, popular science is also from US educators. For example, mm -hmm. Bill Nye, science guy, yeah. uh, or um, Neil Stigris Tyson, uh, you know, the, these guys, so, so we don't have such a popular figures 
in, at the national level or even at the state level in India. Uh, what's your take on like, you know, does that help people to cling on to at least, you know, a few, uh, you know, big names or popular figures, then they can start getting into science and, you know, then they will search themselves and so on. Would that um, make a difference? Yes, thank you for your question. I think that it is very, the first thing I will say is uh, maybe the future Indian Bill Nye is in this all with us. If it doesn't exist yet, it, it, I'm sure someone will take that role because it's important uh, that also there is an, an Indian uh, that can speak to uh, people because Bill Nye doesn't speak for everyone. He doesn't always speak for me. He's a white man. Um, uh, but at the same time, there is importance to those figures, right? And uh, I think that they do a lot for uh, science image. They're very human. Uh, they're funny. <laughs> Scientists sometimes aren't seen as very funny. Um, at the same time, not everyone has to be uh, Bill Nye or Neil deGrasse Tyson. There are many different forms of science communication. Even if your science communication is uh, speaking with your neighbor, that's an important form of the human side of science. I think, I think that might be the big part of it is that they're they're humans. Thank you for your question. Yeah, that was a good answer. Thank you. Hello. 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 Hello, madam. Uh, very good for your presentation. It is very useful for me. And then I am Dr. Dharmaraj from Bharatiya University, Coimbatore. Uh, so what I, what is my question means, uh, there are so many publications that are um, reached to all peoples, but uh, one more person uh, comments in the comment box. Uh, he said, and uh, all uh, all international publication should be converted in the uh, local language so it is possible to uh, reach to the all peoples so it is a uh, it is a wonderful idea for that so what is your recommendation for uh, this field yes language is very important and yes, I wish my Tamil was better so I could speak to people in their actual language. It's uh, and local. <laughs> and ask Nikumar about my Tamil. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, very important uh, local communication. I would say I, I think local communication is where change happens. There is this mass communication. There are these big celebrities. And they are very important. We were just talking about Neil deGrasse Tyson and Bill Nye. But I think local, local communication knows about local issues, knows about local problems, knows about local knowledges that can inform science. Science is not one way to the people. The people also talk back to science and say, oh, I live on this land. Here's what I know about this land. Knowledge comes in all sorts of forms. So I would say, yes. Local is very important. I want to make sure I understood the question, though. I think I was just agreeing. <laughs> okay, okay, ma'am. Madam, just I would like to add one more point here for uh, Dharmarajan Sa's uh, question. Yeah. Yes, uh, it is true, sir, but in majority of the countries, at least for abstract, they will publish in their local language. For yes, example, sir. if you go to France, they give top priority for French, French yes, yes. And if yes. you go to Japan, they developed a software which will convert the whole English into a Japanese. So yes, sir. those things can be easily done. But if you find a way to do that one, then the life uh, as well as the task may be much easier. Yes, sir. But, but common people are expecting uh, uh, their uh, um, local language. Uh, oh, what, okay. what we are doing, what we are doing, what, what we did any research so they need to know no, that's that only is, i'm asking like that yes sir. no that is what i am saying sir otherwise we have to sit and write <laughs> yes yeah yes, no sir. other chance because well, a lot of well, time sir. we write papers and we forget about that one 
previously okay, nobody okay. written the paper at least that stage has come but uh, in that stage once again we try to do as much as possible in tamil there are lot of magazines in tamil which is putting signs for example uh, ariga arivial which is bringing yes, wonderful information vinyana chudar and the most yes. probably uh, my teacher uh, uh, gr sir is here he has edited a couple of those kind of magazines he would uh, he can give more information about that one but we have to spend our time to give the valuable information to them that is the only way we can take it for that okay sir thank you thank you very much one, one more thing uh, dr narajan yes, may sir. add up for your information the bardas university as practicing but whenever the researcher submits his phd yes sir yes sir the, the synapses should be translated into the tamil and then it is published see we are also practicing see people not yes. ignoring certain facts in india we have the popular science talking people also like dr hegde how many of you listen to dr hegde from manipal from the karnataka he is an excellent man doctor he speaks for the common people if you listen to him he will sensitize all this this is the way in which approach we have we have we have practiced in the bardas university in chitrapalli the university insists that all the research must translate their abstract into the tamil and then they have a publication we have number of things but it is not reaching to the common man that that is the problem in india see there are publication there are there like department of science and technology government of india have the popular science articles out there in hindi tamil all the regional languages they pop how many have the access to that how many of them going a scientist not even opening that website also this is the pity see we blame the popular science we blame the science see science is the scientist has to do for his science approach then there is the other people the other group where they are interested in the common people read that meet the people understand that and transform into the regional languages for the common people the scientist cannot do a teacher cannot do such thing even he don't know terms of the in regional language term certain things suppose i say that uh, the breeding biology i am not doing in tamil terms that that is the we have the that knowledge in india we have different languages that is the problem in india so but still we are practicing the translate there is a one department the uh, biochemistry department where the entire thesis phd thesis is translated in tamil that is happened in 1970s there is in madras university the researcher must submit in tamil also one article uh, that that also that they are practice but we are not reaching to the public that's the problem that's what i want to submit for this sir at this point i would like to share some of my experience as i pointed out in the beginning writing to common man is the art which is badly needed and we have to spend an enormous amount of time to learn that one the one thing very recently i have given a presidential address for tamil department uh, one of the conferences where i was giving a uh information because that conference about uh, migration of tamil literature that was the topic of the conference i was talking about animal migration in which i was telling about uh, butterfly migration of uh, 2000 to 3000 kilometers one of the popular writer most of you know uh, the malan sir he has come to me and he asked do they really fly that much long distance that is what he asked me yes they do even they don't weigh for a 5 rupee coin uh, gram how do they manage to travel they do that is what i said to him and he went there after that uh, he did not contact or anything he said that he will contact me but he never contacted me but after 2 to 3 weeks time he wrote a wonderful article in kumudam a magazine i read that magazine i i i am amazed to see the information what he has given i said only one point they are capable of flying 2000 to 3000 km that is what the only information he did not uh, uh, ready to accept that point he went there he read lot of uh, paper and he wrote a wonderful tamil article if i need to write that article i had to spend another 50 years of practicing to write that article that is what uh, the situation but at least uh, whatever as you pointed out one page abstract which we are following that is really taking us to think about at least a few terms but uh, in those kind of situation although it is not a perfect tamil translation sometimes we can use transliteration of few words to make uh, science popular among the public nikola i have sh- one yeah i want to thank you for sharing that um i i think it's 
it, it illustrates an important point of knowing knowing our strengths. Um, this is, I mean, that was part of my story of, of realizing that other people who were better biologists and I could be someone who studies biologists. Um, I think it is a good point to uh, note collaborations are so essential. To work with someone who can be a good writer or to translate for me or um, other people are better at making videos than I am. So we need one another to do this really important work. I think that's a great illustration. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Just I would like to share one more information and I also like to ask other people on this aspect because quite a lot of time we do a lot of research i do as a environmental biologist i do research particularly wetlands is my field and i do work on mangroves and i hailed from a village which is having a mangrove but i did three years of research and did a lot of things and i studied a lot and i got a phd and everything my father yes, no, just had three years pre-university qualification. When oh. I go on to say some of the thing as a fascinating discovery, he simply says further news about uh, those kind of information which I yet to explore scientifically. So invariably, I have seen the old people audible. from the village, they really have an yeah, enormous amount of knowledge which we don't uh, One really get uh, and appreciate. And invariably, quite a lot of time that because after I discussed with my father a couple of times, I learned a lot from him. Although I got PhD degree, postdoctoral, everything, but he is in the village, he roams around and he observes and he simply says, This is what happens. This is you go and check, this will be the case. This is very easy, very, very, very simply he says. I took enormous amount of effort to learn something, but simply he says, by, by, by going through that one, I have seen a couple of uh, articles, particularly from Australia, the knowledge treasure uh, of uh, Aborigines people. So a couple of articles came taking interview from that people about science and they published that matched with the scientific discovery but it perfectly matches well with them so those kind of information still we don't need to follow in the name of scientific development the old knowledge we don't preserve or save in several countries that is one of my really really uh, feeling because now the materialistic world we look for information we see for the benefit of that information but those people they lived with that, that information they learned that information they are going to with the die with that information but we never harvested that information nicole do you have any idea for this kind of situation to harvest that knowledge treasure from those kind of old people and i told i definitely agree i think that um a lot of the work that i do uh, and this is especially troubling in uh, Western culture. We always see science knowledge as like on top and all other knowledge is as below. And I think there is a time for understanding there can be an exchange between people in academia and local people who know more about the places they live than we do. Um, and like you said, can very quickly uh, exchange and collaborate. Um, I think that a lot of the research I do is science as a conversation versus science as a presentation. And I think that that sort of change in mindset will hopefully lead to greater depth of information like you were explaining. Today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, next, Dr. Shankar, uh, sir, wanted to ask something. Yes, please, sir. Dr. KRS, sir, over to you. Hello, sir. Sir, we are waiting for you, sir. Dr. KRS, sir, Shankaran, sir. We are waiting for your query. Yeah, we could wait for uh, him some more time. So in case someone can uh, have uh, queries, you can ask now. Uh so may I, uh, you know, ask one more question uh, in, in connection with the discussion, uh, you know, uh, 
that Nicole and uh, as well as uh, uh, Nagar and Sarva are having. So I, I do agree that, you know, the indigenous people uh, do have a lot of knowledge uh, that we need to harvest and so on. But uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it is also important that scientists should go and science should get involved to verify the information, to, uh, to, to verify the observations, and then document it. Because most of the things over generations, they get diluted. Uh, over generations, they get, uh, uh, you know, mythological and so on. That also can happen, uh, in my opinion. So, how, yeah, how, how do you see that? Yes, thank you. Um, we would, these exchanges still operate under the same um, epistemologies, the same ways of knowing. So we would still look for evidence. We would still apply scientific methods. Um, so these exchanges of knowledge can happen. And yes, often some things are uh, very true and save us years of time. Uh, and other things are maybe stories and, and maybe partially true or not true at all. Um, but we can still apply the same types of testing of evidence that we do with all the rest of our work. This is the lens that we see the world through as scientists um, can be just as easily applied. Uh, yeah, I, 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 yes, sir. I, I do agree with you that a uh, lot of information being diluted and uh, yes. most of the time we may get some information which may not be correct. But with my father, the experience I got is much more convincing than my own science discovery. Therefore, I had no other choice except to believe in him. Because <laughs> after he said, I went and I checked, I took yeah. uh, years to find out that one. But he simply said a couple of other things which I tested, which really worked. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sure, sir, sure. There is that testing. Jake Mar, yeah. Audible is not available. I think uh, I do agree. Dr. Jake Mar. Hello. 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 Sir, Shankaran, sir, you can ask, sir. Sir, you are audible, sir. Yes, we, you are audible. You can ask, sir. Sir? I think he has uh, left the meeting. I think uh, in that case, uh, Dr. Nagarajan, I do just join you in the traditional knowledge of your father. When I went for the field work for the peacocks in the villages, and one day I was just in the cotton field, and the villagers said, Sir, it come, the peacock comes and destroys my cotton field. It, it loves to eat on the peacock buds, flower bud. I was thinking, the peacock eat the flower buds. Obviously, <laughs> sir, you don't know that. You just go and taste. I was worried. I'm scared to go and eat that one. Then they said, sir, don't worry. We will take you to the hospital. Then from that day, I, was, I learned to eat. I love the cotton bud. Very tasty, very delicious. That is why I learned from the villagers that peacock loves to eat and that. So they will go. That is why I'm doing the feeding behavior of the peacock. I learned from the traditional knowledge that this is what we should not underestimate the traditional knowledge. So then only the science also improves and develops. So that way I always enjoy. I learned a lot of things from the, uh, we should not say layman. They're all the knowledgeable person. We wrongly term them illiterate. That is why the scientists are not able to say they are illiterate, they don't know. They have the, without science, they have the scientific background. That's what I, my experience. I, whatever thing we have to give waiting for this traditional life. I do agree with Dr. Nagarajan. So otherwise we do not know that. How much literature is such, we believe to it. So excellent. See, this is what we have to develop. Scientists must go to that level and reach to that people. And we had a program, lab to field program, vice versa. You go to the, come to the lab, whatever you have the achievement, go to the field, meet other people, whether your lab experience is coinciding with your field programs and with the the common man, and then you check your science. See, that's what science is supposed to do. See, you go to the field, meet the, the popular man, and get the feedback. Come to your check your scientific. That is the validity. Then it is the card accountability to the society. You must give the accountability. Then the popular science will become very popular. That's what I want to do. All right. Thank you, sir. I Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Um, just some time ago, we were 
Thank you. Yes, we, we need to make sure our human needs are taken care of before we are, are wanting to read some lofty science journal. And I think that that is a very, and that's part of what I'm interested in is humanizing science. And so uh, a lot of what, uh, like for example, when I work with uh, local children who need food um, and I want them to do climate change work with me, we make sure that there's food. We, we make sure that people are taken care of because people are most important in this. And the science can happen after our bellies are full, things like that. So I think you bring up an excellent point that there are realities to crossing these gaps. And I think we cross these gaps as, as full human beings. Thank you for your question. Thanks. Yeah, so is there any more uh, stories? Yeah, in case if, if not, yes, Dr. Pandian on the yes. last something. Yes, please, yeah. sir. Yeah. Good evening, madam. Uh, OK, uh, thanks to Dr. Jayakumar. Arlene, such a very excellent uh, topic and also that uh, very significant seminar today uh, to the webinar. And uh, Nicola Bennett, madam, your talk was very nice. You know, uh, you gave a very excellent information. Uh, pertaining to the current trend, particularly the science. Are you audible? Yes, you're audible. Okay. Yes. But uh, I have a number of questions. But already Dr. R. Nagarajan, sir, he is our head of the department, my former professor, Dr. M. C. Satya Narayana, and Vidalai. So several people have asked a number of questions. It was very nice. But uh, Bennett, madam, why does everyone need an understanding of science? Because in India, uh, in particular in Tamil Nadu, uh, scientists, not only scientists only totally transforming that uh, fact of science or about the science to non-science people. What I would say, the popular science or development of science or growth of science or um, other sites, it depends on the interest of the people. And that uh, natural Hindu, that interest of the individual. So, if you force him to, uh, if you wanted to force to somebody else, you want to read science, you want to understand about fact of science means it is other kind of harassment. See, Dr. Aransar is also told that impact factor is something. You know, popular science article will get more impact factor because it can be cited by more number of public people rather than. Scientific, pap scientific papers or scientific articles are cited by only scientists. So where 
the citation in scientific article will get low number of citations but if you go to popular article you will get more number of citations because it's a two different group of people will read your article right in that sense in india tamil nadu there is a book called panjangam you know panjangam it is written by a group of authors we do not know their basic fundamental education background but that book the main content of the book is revealing you know that when is the new moon is coming when is the full moon is coming when is the lunar eclipse and you know solar eclipse or something natural disaster uh, there are many more things they have described but it now it is you know uh, if you go to if you come to tamil nadu without having even that elementary education they could say about that what is the future trend about the world when the world will disappear the panjangam is saying but i do not know when they have learned these are the technique mathematical they have arrived without even single nanoseconds it will not change if you going to see the book panjangam they are describing and telling that what happened the next hour next second it is happening so like farmers or non science people are also have written and they are they have already communicated still it is very big amazing you know so that what i want to say now whether do you want to popularize the science whether do you want to popularize the science to the non science people or do you want to sell the science to the non science people because the science is having number of technology yes sir there are number yeah. of yes okay this is what i'm telling you now the if you going to see that the mobile phone the mobile phone is used by everybody in the world so the the you know what is yeah that is why science is already popularized and is growing well i think if you if you want to communicate you know it depends on the mother tongue quality the language interest of the individual and also the your objective what do you want to communicate to the people otherwise it is a waste of time but don't mistake me what you are doing is very excellent but why you want to communicate science each and everybody in the world that is my question please eh? Thank you. Thanks. 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 I agree with you, sir. Um, um, uh, I, don't, I don't think that I would ever argue for, for giving people suggestions for science. Um, I think that you were making an excellent point that it matters to think about what matters to your audience. Um, often as scientists, we can get caught in the philosophy that uh, science is good for you, and that's the end of the thought. Um, but you're exactly right that science, uh, for for a non-scientist, sometimes science is a useful thing, and we we want to share that. Um, but it's not necessary to know every science fact. I don't know every fact about economics. Um, an economist might uh, disagree that I should know everything. Um, but I think that you are. I, I'm in agreement with you. I'm in. Yes. Yeah, absolute agreement with you that matters, but matters to your audience. I'm also seeing in the chat our friend um, who wasn't able okay. to uh, speak up, um, Mutamil Arasu is an eighth grader, and was discuss uh, discussing um, format. And uh, Mutamil makes a really great point about a uh, grandfather who listens to the radio because of not being able to see very well. And I think that is such an excellent point of knowing your audience, knowing how they want to receive information. So thank you for that excellent point. Okay. Okay, I have some other question. What do we have? Yeah, yeah if there are uh, some more questions can be asked, there's one or two questions because no, we are running out of time. Nicole have to go. Uh, yeah, so no, just uh, one last question. <laughs> yes. Thank you for your response. If there are no questions, then we could uh, know, uh, wind up the sessions. Uh, principal, sir, uh, could we proceed, sir? Yeah, yeah, please, please go ahead, uh, Jai Kumar. Yes, thank you so much, sir. Uh, now I would request uh, uh, Dr. R. Kartike and sir, R&D cell director to propose a vote of thanks. Over to you, sir. Good evening. Good evening, all. I'm Mr. Mike, acknowledge and take the program for 
பிரின்சிபல் for his uh, motivation enthusiastic encouragement and uh, for his uh, lucid uh, presentation address for today's webinar and i also thank our retired professor dr mps uh, dr gr sir dr uh, rk sir for their presence and participation really which uh, uh, colored today's webinar i can say then moreover our today's resource person uh <coughs> nicholas bennett that was a research fellow from usca night resource associate center for media engagement moody college of communication of university of texas usca for her lucid strategic scientific Uh, informative presentation on her idea really it is wonderful to hear listen your presentation ma'am then on behalf of our college we wholeheartedly thank you thank you very much for your uh, wonderful presentation then i thank all the participants of this webinar for their active participation so finally i thank dr yam murthy of uh, department of zoology faculty members of department of zoology and wildlife biology dr a yamuna of uh, department of mathematics and r balamurgan of uh, rafis uh, for their technical assistance and the support thank you thank you once again all thank you very much thank you so much sir thank you for your wonderful vote of thanks yes participants feedback links are available in the chat box please click that and get your uh, certificates uh, fill the details correctly and carefully so that you could get the certificate video put thing janikira thank you madam thank you nicole madam for your uh, wonderful uh, talk we really you know enjoyed your talk thank you so much and uh, again we would listen to you on the occasion of you know other day on uh, climate change and the effect of uh, climate change on butterflies that would be you know uh, most interesting one uh, you know to be added up in the future so i would also thank uh, uh, our principal who is always you know uh, keen having keen, keen interest in organizing such uh, uh, conferences and you know, webinars he also you know uh, led the discussion part and thank you so much uh, principal sir for your you know, uh, help and support thank you and i thank all my uh, staff members and especially dr j pandian sir who participated in the discussion uh, my coordinator uh, gs madam and all the staff members who actively participated in the webinar thank you so much uh, yeah we could you know wind up shortly and then we will meet uh, quickly on another occasion thank you so much yes, thanks thanks jay kumar thanks 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 for your thank effort you, thanks kachode also thank, thank you, you thank you